Our topic is 4 times 3 equals 7. 4 times 3 equals 7, a gospel health talk. Tonight we want to look at four principles. Four principles found in the Word of God. Biblical principles we see that are repeated at least three times in the Scripture. Many of these things we're going to find in the beginning, in the life of Christ, or in the middle of the Bible, and also at the end, or even in the earth made new. Three things, three times, we're going to see it witnessed throughout the Scriptures at least. And these four principles are going to show us a perfect understanding of health. A perfect understanding of God's plan for health. Four times three equals seven. Our first principle. Principle number one, a plant-based diet and the drinking of water. For those that are designed to have this health that God desires, a plant-based diet and the drinking of water is the first principle of this idea, of God's idea for perfect health. Let's look at the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis what chapter are we looking for? One. Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, we're looking at the first principle of four, a plant-based diet and war. Let's see if we can find that example or illustrated in the Word of God. In Genesis 1 and verse 29, I'd like to turn your attention to the first diet God gave in the Scriptures. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29. Say amen if you have that. And Genesis 1 should be the first chapter of your Bible, the 29th verse. It says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for... And that word meat means food, correct? What was the first diet given by God to man in his perfect state? A plant-based diet. A diet that came from the tree, the same place Jesus died, he hung up on the tree. In the same place where we were to get our food in the beginning from a tree, this diet came. The plant-based diet in the Garden of Eden also was connected with, according to Genesis 2 and verse 10, for those that are taking notes. In Genesis 2 and verse 10, it said that a river came into Eden and watered Eden and gave Eden all its bounties, all its fruit, all its, its, its verdure was made by the drinking of water. Even Adam and Eve were surrounded by all these free-flowing rivers to quench their living thirst. A plant-based diet and water was the diet that God gave to man to maintain a perfect body, made in His image, in holiness. And what do you think would be a good diet to return to the principles of holiness? Or to keep this body, even in its sickness, from disease or to restore health, the same diet. We're going to find when we look at the book of Daniel in the middle of your Bible. In the book of Daniel, we see that Daniel was given a test concerning diet. And as a servant of God, notice what diet that he chose to partake of and the results of this diet. To see this diet is not only a diet for the beginning, but even for the restoration, preservation of health, and even for spiritual power. Daniel 1 says this. Turn down to the middle of your Bible and look at the book of Daniel. Daniel, the first chapter. Daniel chapter 1. We're looking at the diet and the water that God would have us to drink if we would have a beginning in the spiritual health for these last days. We're looking for the book of Daniel, chapter 1, Daniel the first chapter, and notice what happened to the prophet Daniel in the kingdom of Babylon. Daniel chapter 1, beginning of verse 8. Notice this test of which diet was better, a diet based upon flesh, based upon the wine that the kings or the heathens drank, or this plant-based diet, and what? And the drinking of water. Daniel 1 and verse 8. Daniel, verse one and, sorry, Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. What would he do? Turn your page over to verse 12. Verse 12. In verse 12 of Daniel 1 it says, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, how many days? Ten days. Ten days and let them give us pulse to eat and water to to drink. Now you find various definitions of the word pulse. Maybe in your margin it might say something like beans. In some margin it says seeds. And some margins it says that from the field or, some, or food from the field. Pulse are those foods that are brought from the earth, like beans, like seeds, those things that come from the earth. It's a plant-based diet. And this plant-based diet and water was given as a test over all the other children and all the other great minds of the world. Because remember, Babylon had conquered all the then known world. And all the children from all the various other promises that were conquered also were given this diet that the king had and the wine which he drank. And just these Hebrew worthies were taking this plant-based diet and water for 10 days to see if their diet versus the diet that all the other world was taking, which would be superior. And after 10 days, 
What do you think were the result of the physical, mental, and spiritual power that was afforded by this diet? What do you think was the result? Look what it says. In Daniel chapter 1, we continue. Daniel 1, look at the mental benefit from the result of this diet. In verse 20, it says this. In Daniel 1, verse 20, it says, In all manners of wisdom and understanding, that the king inquired of them when they were tested after the 10 days. He found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Was this diet that God gave at the beginning, that Daniel continued in here in this test in Babylon, was able to give mental power? It says they were 10 times better. What about spiritually? In verse 17 it says this, Does the diet that God gives not only have a physical benefit for the body, but also is there a spiritual aspect even in the moral powers of the mind, even the spiritual powers? Verse 17, it says, As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and... Now, brothers and sisters, do you know that when you really study the Bible carefully, and we may look at this in another study, when you study the Bible carefully, that there is a necessary type of diet if you're going to understand prophecy. In another study, we're going to show from the Word of God that there is a diet, there is a way of eating and drinking that is essential for you to have a correct understanding of God's prophecies. You say, what? The gospel is not meat and drink? No, the gospel is not meat and drink. But yet still, the way of con conducting this body and maintaining this body in sanctification and honor that you may understand spiritual things needs, number one, the spiritual power of God in transform transforming the mind. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2. The spiritual power of God in transforming the mind and also how we treat this physical body by giving it a living sacrifice, holy except unto God. These two things allow you to come into the perfect will of God, even to understand His perfect will as expressed through the scriptures, through the gospel, and through prophecy. Daniel had understanding of visions and dreams because he ate a diet or had a habits or a lifestyle that were conducive to understanding spiritual truth and making a decision about it. But also there's a physical benefit. A physical benefit. In Daniel 1 and verse 15 it says this. Daniel 1 15. At the end of the 10 days, their countenances, that's how they physically appeared, appeared fairer, beautiful, and fattier, healthier, in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the... Here's a comparison now. In this comparison, in a physical sense, in their appearance. Mentally, in their abilities, uh, as far as intelligence, and also in a spiritual sense, when it comes to knowledge, and also understanding the spiritual truths of God, there was a benefit afforded by their religious experience in connection with what? A plant-based diet and water. Now, brothers and sisters, you may ask yourself, well, if God gave them the beginning, if in the literal Babylon, this was something that was done, what about those coming out of spiritual Babylon? And you may say, not only that, if it was good in the beginning, and it was good then, but not only may it be good now, but how long will this diet of a plant-based diet and water, how long will this diet be effective for the people of God? In Revelation 22, it says this. Revelation 22, look at the 22nd chapter of Revelation, and notice what the scriptures say here. Revelation 22 Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1 and 2. In Revelation 22 and verse 1 and 2, I'll say to you very clearly that the Word of God shows us that this diet not only began in the beginning, but it'll go into eternity. This is the diet of those that are, are part of the everlasting gospel. When does the everlasting gospel end? When does the everlasting gospel begin? And was there a diet connected with the gospel in the beginning? Was there a diet connected with Daniel's understanding of truth in Babylon? Is there a diet going to go into eternity? Look what it says in Revelation 22. And brothers and sisters, I want to be a part of the everlasting gospel. Not a temporal gospel, not a social gospel, not a gospel of black liberation theology, all the various things that are taking the church over. I want to be a part of the everlasting gospel. And there's a way of eating and drinking. There's a message of temperance that attends the message from Adam all the way to the second Adam. And in Revelation 22 and verse 1 it says this, And he showed me in heaven a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river there was what? The tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruit. What kind of diet is that? A plant-based diet. And yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the but says, where is this taking place? In heaven. And we see that from the throne of God, a clear water of life proceeded, and there was 
fruit for the people of God to eat and also the leaves were for medicine and this plant-based diet and water was what the people of God were going to continue to eat throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. From the beginning to the middle to the end. But that's only the first principle, the first principle of four that's going to give us a clear or perfect understanding of God's outline for health. What's the second one? Let's go on. Simple herbs. Turn to the book of Genesis again. Simple herbs. Not only is a plant-based diet, a high-fiber diet, a diet of fruits, nuts, vegetables, grains, and so on, going to afford mental strength, physical strength, even give us greater moral power in connection with the Holy Spirit, but also simple herbs, another principle by which God is going to deal with the diseases of the nations and also help us avoid the dangers of some even modern medicines. In Genesis, the third chapter, notice what happened after the, the beginning of sin. Genesis 3 and verse 18. We're on our second topic or second aspect of the principles of health, which are simple herbs. We're in Genesis 3 and verse 18. What is the wages of sin? The wages of sin is what? Do people die immediately when they sin in every instance? What happens slowly to the people as they continue in sin? They die. What's the process of dying usually composed of? Disease. So when it says the wages of sin is death, those wages are often connected with the gradual, progressive diseases and sicknesses that also accompany. That's why Jesus said, to those that he healed from those diseases. He says, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. He knew that this, this, this disease that he removed, he really was removing their sins. And many that were healed by Christ, they also were healed of their sins. And he said, now that I've removed this disease from you, I've removed this power of sin from you as well, go and do what? Sin no more, lest you get that Disease again. There's a connection between sin and disease. And when we look at this understanding, in the book of Genesis chapter 3, God, Jesus, I say, the creator, knowing that this was the eventuality of sin, when man sinned, he immediately added to this diet of fruits, nuts, and so on, this plant-based diet, another plant that was going to assist or, in a simple way, give strength or medicine to the body. Now remember, we just saw in Revelation 22 that the leaves of the tree were for the what? healing of the nation. And these leaves here in Genesis 3, we're going to read also, were for the healing of the nations prior to heaven. It says this in Genesis 3 and verse 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, meaning the earth. And thou shalt eat what? Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. You can consider eating the herb of the field? No, these things were necessary. Vegetables and the various herbs that grow you know, when you go to Walmart and these various stores today, don't you notice that when you go to the health food section or the, the vitamin section that the majority of the so-called vitamins or health products are herbs now? Why is that? Because God's truth has never gone out of style. And you'll find that many people are taking all these various different types of medicines and these medicines generally have side effects or other diseases. They have a poisonous nature. When God has given us simple remedies or simple herbs that are supposed to give us or minister to us the strength from the earth that are not readily uh, obtained just by diet alone. Yes, this diet in the beginning was perfect for man in his innocence, perfect for man in his wholeness, and even perfect for us today. Yet, I would submit to you that because of disease, God added this herb, because it was going to be a medicine, going to help us. You know, in Psalms 104, I think in verse 14, if I'm not mistaken, Psalm 104, 14, it says that the grass was made for the cattle and the herb for the service of man. Now, if you look at that word service, that word service means ministry. In the original language, the word means ministry. It means that the herb was to minister to man, to give him something, which obviously those fruit and the various different foods in Genesis 129 were not clearly to afford him. You said, that, well, wasn't the diet in God's beginning perfect? It was. But was the world perfect? No. That diet was perfect, but was the earth perfect? No. And we know that when we look at the train of events that happened from the book of Genesis on down, when Adam and Eve sinned, did the earth become cursed? Yes. yes. When Cain killed Abel, was the earth cursed again? Yes. And the God of heaven said, the earth will not yield its strength unto thee. So that there was a strength from the earth that could not be readily obtained just by the perfect diet that was in Genesis 129. So God added something there for to deal with sin called the herb. And this herb now is going to give man and give you and I a ministry that's not easily afforded just by things from the tree. Can you follow that? 
And when we look at the book of Genesis, it's showing us that this was added because of sin, because there were some things that were going to come upon man because of sin, that these herbs were going to help. Now, you look at these various different herbs. You ever heard of aspirin? You know what the main part of aspirin is that causes you to have relief from pain? Willow bark. You ever heard of the willow tree? Yeah. The bark from the willow tree is the main ingredient in aspirin. Now they, they bind it with a chemical that causes your stomach to bleed and some other different problems, but the main part of it is from a tree. And you find that many of the very different herbs that you find very, very effective in the world today, these things are coming from herbs in our modern society. People have taken now chemicals and tried to chemically try to make things because can you make a lot of money off of just shaving some bark off a tree or pulling up some grass or taking some flowers and drying them and using it or making an oil, pressing the oil from things and using those things instead of medicine? You can't make a lot of money from that. You can't make thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars doing that. It's simple. God's plan and the simple things of nature were easy to access, easy to get a hold of, and the people of God were blessed by them. But look at the book of John. Now. Well, as a matter of fact, Song of Solomon, I beg your pardon. Look at Song of Solomon. In the scriptures, all through the scriptures, we have been directed, even though we have not been listening, to look at and examine and to take note of these simple plants and these simple herbs for the healing of the nation. In the book of Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon chapter 4, notice what the Bible says. You have Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon chapter 4 and verse 13. Let's drop our eyes here again. Song of Solomon chapter 4. And let's look at verse, verse 13. Now we know Song of Solomon is a love song, amen? amen? What greater love has God than to give Christ? And Christ was a healer, amen? And not only was Christ great in giving his love to us in healing, but in this love song, the Song of Solomon, you find some of the most powerful superfoods, the powerful phytochemicals that all the world is talking about now. You find them listed in the catalog out for you point by point in the Song of Solomon. And it's directing our minds in the love of God to look at these things, examine these things, that we might be able to understand simple herbs are part of God's plan to deal with the wages of sin. In Song of Solomon chapter 4 and verse 13, notice what the scriptures say. It says in this chapter this, Thy plants, are we there? Amen. Thy plants are an orchard of... Anyone heard anything about pomegranates lately? Amen. What's it called? A superfood, right? Yeah. It's, it's good for cleansing the blood, expelling worms. It's, it's an antioxidant of, of the greatest level. And it's found over and over again in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, the high priest at the bottom of his robe, what did he have? Pomegranate. And that the high priest would walk, those pomegranates would sway back and forth, and the pomegranate is full of seeds. Luke 8, 11 said the seed is the word of God. This, this plant that had so many seeds, even thousands and thousands of seeds, was indicative of the power of the word of God, that the fruit of God is full of seed. It's full of the word. And by partaking of that word, we partake of the life of God. What did that woman touch that had the issue of blood on Jesus? The hem of the garment, right where the high priest would have those bells and pomegranates, she reached out and that's where she laid hold of the word, if you were. And that's how she received the staunching of her disease. And here it says that thy plants, in verse 13, are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, camphor. Is that an herb? Spikenard. It says, verse 14, spikenard and, here's another one, saffron. All these are those things used for food and also for medicine. Saffron. Calmus and cinnamon with all trees of what? Frankincense, myrrh, and aloes, and with all the chief spices. Now, brothers and sisters, all we see, and you can go to many other texts, we see over and over and over again this chapter, this book, directing our mind to all the greatest herbs found. As a matter of fact, you ever heard of aloes before? Amen. Aloe vera grows prolifically here. The heathens believed the aloe was a, a magical plant because of its ability to be cut and placed upon wounds, even horrible wounds, and then when it was removed, it would be practically healed. They thought it was a miracle plant. It would be placed upon cuts, upon burns, upon various different swellings, and by placing it upon it, it seemed to draw out and even heal the flesh. It would remove disease. Now, brothers and sisters, the Bible says that Aloes was among the chief things that we were to look at and have among us as those that love God. Those that are in this love relationship with God. Why? Because this love relationship with God removes 
sin. And when we remove sin, we're removing also disease. So these things are showcased or revealed to you in the Song of Solomon because it's a part of God's plan to do what? Remove disease or remove what? Sin. It's all a part of God's perfect plan. Now, let's drop our eyes down to Ezekiel very quickly. We looked at this text in the book of Revelation. But let's look at the book of Ezekiel. We're looking for the book of Ezekiel. As we come to a close in our second session, we're going on to number three in a moment. But look at Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel, what chapter are we looking for? 47. Ezekiel 47 and verse 12. Notice the same scripture we saw in Revelation 22, spoken of by the prophet Ezekiel. And now we see again that God, even in the earth made new, as we mentioned before, is interested in the power of simple herbs. In Ezekiel 47, Ezekiel 47 and verse 12, it says this. Ezekiel 47 and verse 12. The Bible says, And by the river, upon the bank thereof, and on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for and whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary. And the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Brothers in the earth made new, this tree of life and all the trees, it says that their fruit won't be consumed. That means they're not going to eat it? It means that there'll be such an abundance it won't be able to be all eaten. All the untold number of the redeemed will not be able to consume all the fruit that's contained down these trees. And it says also that the fruit would be for their meat, for their food, and the leaf would be for what? Medicine. Why do we need medicine in the earth made new? When we have new bodies? And we are, and we are not mortal, but we have this immortal body. Why do we need this medicine? The effect of sin. We need to grow. There's the effect of sin that even God is going to deal with through these plant-based foods or these simple remedies, both in the beginning, throughout the scriptures, and even after we get into the earth made new, God's going to use simple medicine. As a matter of fact, do you know that the Word of God shows that the children of Israel anciently had medicine from heaven? Remember in Psalm 77, it says that that manna fell from heaven. What was that manna? Psalm 77 says it was the corn of heaven. So manna was a plant-based diet from heaven? Do you remember when God, Jesus, was in, on the earth? Remember how he came and he was in the wilderness and he was faint and he was about to, to, to be completely hungered and the devil came and tempted him and he tried to get him to eat and to try to, to blaspheme in the name of God? And after the devil left him, what did the, what did the Bible say? The angels came and did what? They came on and ministered unto him. What do they think they did to, for Jesus? They probably gave him some food and some water. Because when Elijah was, was hungry, when Elijah was in the wilderness, what did the, the, the angel give him? Food and water. Bread and... What kind of bread do angels have? We just found it out. It was manna. It was the bread of heaven. And water. So when they ministered Christ, they fed him. When they ministered Elijah, they fed him. And brothers, guess what angels want to do to us? They want to feed us. And this diet, this plant-based diet and water that was given to Christ and Elijah, God wants to give it to us in these last days. Even we'll be eating it in the earth made new. And this food is medicine. Caleb said, from eating man all those years, those 40 years, when he was 80 years old, Caleb said, I had the strength of a man 40 years old. He said, give me my land, give me my inheritance. I had the same strength today that I had when I was 40. When Moses, after eating that man for 40 years, the Bible says that his natural force was not abated and his eyes were not dim. He had no vision problems and he had the same strength he had when he went into the wilderness eating God's diet. How many want to follow God's diet? And get the fresh water we need daily. And to use simple herbs. But that's not all, brothers and sisters. Because it's not just eating and drinking. But look what it says as we go on. Number three. Number three, number three, juices. What? Juices. But juices of what? Look what it says in 1 Timothy. We're in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 5. What's number three? Juices. Okay. Juices. Now we're looking for 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23. You remember that in the New Testament, 
as well as the Old Testament, there's much talk about wine, not drinking wine and not being given to much wine. Do you know when you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word used in the Greek and the Hebrew for wine, you can't tell whether it's alcoholic wine or it is the juice of a fruit or vegetable. Because juices from fruits, vegetables, and so on are generally used to make alcoholic wines. But you can't tell by the Greek or the Hebrew. You can tell only contextually in the passage. And also, God says his people, from the priest to the regular person, were not to drink alcoholic wine or that which made you inebriated, drunk, or disheveled. It said in Proverbs chapter 30, it's out, sorry, Proverbs, yeah, I said Proverbs 30. I don't know why that escaped my mind. It says, wine is a marker, and strong drink is raging, and whosoever deceived thereby, is not wise. That kind of wine, it says it's red and turned itself right in the cup. That kind of wine calls you to see strange women. That kind of wine God says people want to take, partake of. They were con continually admonished not to partake of that wine which the heathen partook of, but there was a wine that was good for them. Let's look at what it says here in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, sorry, chapter 5, verse, pardon me. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23, Paul says to Timothy, drink no longer water. Are we there? Drink no longer water, but use a little what? Wine. A little wine for thy stomach's sake and thy oft infirmity. Now, brothers and sisters, what type of wine is this? Some people say this is alcohol. This is, you know, table wine. This is the alcohol that people drink in France and all the places. This is good for the stomach, they say. Well, why does, the, why does science say that it destroys the stomach? If it's good for the stomach, how could it be good for the digestive tract and also bad for the digestive tract? How could someone that have ulcers be told not to drink? If this is good for the stomach's sake, this is not the same type of wine. It's the type of wine that God said his people to drink. It was the wine that was right fresh from the vine, right fresh from the cluster. Want to show a text for that? Look at the book of Isaiah. Let's go now to the Old Testament and let's show it and come back forward. In the book of Isaiah 65, notice what new wine or the wine that the people of God were to drink and that God had his blessing upon what type of wine it was. In Isaiah 65, it says this. Isaiah, the 65th chapter, Isaiah 65, the first gospel prophet here, Isaiah, the gospel of Isaiah, chapter 65, and we're dropping our eyes in Isaiah 65, 2, verse 8. Isaiah 65 and verse 8. Please say amen when you have that. Isaiah 65, verse 8. Let's see what type of wine that was in the Old Testament, that even the New Testament, that Paul admonished Timothy to partake of because he was often sick and he needed some wine for his oft infirmities. This type of wine is medicinal. It helps remove disease. Look what it says. Isaiah 65, verse 8 says, Thus saith the Lord as the what kind of wine? And what kind of wine? wine? Notice where the new wine is found. In other words, this is what new wine comes from. When you, want to, when you find this, you're finding new wine. I want you to see that because when you look at this idea, God is saying that when you find this, you're finding new wine. Meaning that this, this, this entity is where new wine is and it is what new wine is. Look what it says. Verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one say, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. What does it say there? It says that the new wine, or the wine that God said has a blessing, where is it found? It's found what? What kind of cluster? In a, in a, in a vine cluster or in a bunch of grapes? It's called a cluster. When you take those bunches of grapes, those are called clusters. A cluster of grapes. Amen? And new wine is found in a cluster. And God said to do what to it? Let it ferment. Put it in a vat and let it go bad and let it go, go completely rancid and then drink it. No, he says the new wine that God's blessing is upon is found where? In the cluster. And we're not to destroy it. Because if we destroy this, this blessing of God and we take it into our body, what's going to do to our body? destroy it. God says our body is the temple of God and this is not to be done with the temple of God. We can't take these rancid and these, these alcoholic beverages into our body and think that we're going to have peace and joy. Do you know one of the greatest causes of rape, murder, domestic violence, home breakups, financial problems, and you name all things across the board and various ailments is alcohol. You know what it does to the liver and the kidneys? You know what it does to the blood cells and the digestive tract? You know what it does to the, even the peace of the nerves? Drinking of alcohol. Taking a blessing, as it says right here, and allowing it to sit and rot. In other words, letting the God's blessings go bad. 
and then try to take it and then call it a blessing. And people even would say that, hey, you know what? <clears throat> what Jesus drank and what Jesus gave at the, at the Last Supper, that was alcohol. That's a lie. That's, that's one of the greatest lies that you've ever seen in the Bible. Because when we read the Bible, point by point, we find out the new wine is what? The wine find where? In the cluster, in the bunch of grapes, and it's not destroyed. It's not been caused to rot or to become rancid. And that's where God's blessing is. And when we look at this idea in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, even in the earth made new, even in heaven, we're going to be drinking these types of wine. The new wine, the juice right from the grape or from a plant-based source that's able to give the body quickly nutrients and even cause the removal of disease. Look at what it says. Look at the book of Matthew now. Matthew 26. How many are still with me? Amen. I may have lost you there. Did, are you still with me? We're finding out that the, the new wine or the wine that God said for his people to drink, where the wine where God's blessing is, Isaiah said, is found in the actual grape. In other words, you could take it and squeeze it. That's new wine. And when you squeeze it, if you don't destroy it, that is new wine where God's blessing is. That's the wine that Jesus both made at the marriage feast at Canaan. That's what Jesus used all throughout his ministry. And at the Last Supper, he drank this type of wine and he proves that this is the wine he drank. Because notice what he says in Matthew 26. Matthew 26, brothers and sisters, we're going to look at this point theologically and then come back and see how practically these things are good for our health. We're in the third topic, which is juices, and we're in Matthew 26 and verse 27. Matthew 26 chapter and verse 27. Please say amen when you have that. Amen. We're in Matthew 26 and verse 27. And again, we say amen. amen. Verse 27 says this. And he took the cup, Jesus meaning, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye. Now, wouldn't that be terrible if that was alcohol? Stop right there. Wouldn't that be terrible if that's all alcohol? If Jesus not only gave you alcohol, but said, hey, drink it all, drink it all, drink it, just drink it. Can you imagine that God would say that to you? And brothers and sisters, do you know the rates of alcoholism in the Catholic Church? We need to really pray for those that are sincerely, I'm not talking about people that, that are doing something, I'm talking about sincerely going into the ministry as Catholic priests, thinking that they're going into doing a work that God's leading them and directing them to, and because they believe that that wine or that cup they believe is alcohol, is fermented wine, and that is the literal body of Christ, they can let one drop of it spill. So when all that big chalice is filled and people drink it all throughout the community and there's some left over, what do they do with it? They don't pour it away. He has to drink it. Drink how much of it? Drink all of it. And that's why the majority of people that are in Catholic ministry doing that type of work, they become alcoholics very quickly because they're forced by the, the, the issue or the tenets of their faith to continually every day go to Mass, even do more than one Mass, and at the end when there's the wine left over, they must drink every drop. And brothers and sisters, that's why connected with that, we see the type of sins that are committed by some people because when your mind and your heart is under the influence of alcohol, your conscience is affected. Do I need to go further than that? And you're able to do things and even engage in things that with a right mind you would not do. I'm going to leave that point, but go back to our text now. In Matthew 26 and verse 27, again it says, And he took the cup and said to them, Drink ye all of it, verse 28, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of what? Of this fruit of the... What, is that? what does that take your mind? Back to Isaiah 65. He said, I will not drink any more of this fruit of the vine. What was he drinking? The fruit of the vine. He said, until... That day when I drink it, how? New. Old, fermented, aged. He said, I'm going to drink it where? New. new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus says, this wine that I'm giving to you, this wine that I said to drink all of it, this wine, I will not drink no, any more of this wine, this fruit of the vine, until I drink this same wine new with you where? in my father's kingdom. Now brothers and sisters, first of all, he said it was the fruit of the vine, first of all. Then he said, this same wine, I'm going to drink this same wine, no more, until I drink the same thing again with you in. So in other words, the same thing he's going to drink there is the same thing he's drinking right now. Can anything ferment in heaven? Can anything, will there be dying and crying and all death? And so how can anything ferment? How can it be alcohol here and then pure wine there? If it's the same thing. It's an error, brothers and sisters. It's part of the wine of Babylon. 
And many people, I've even heard some people that say they're part of the remnant, they actually believe that that was alcoholic wine. Ordained ministers. Mm. Brothers and sisters, this wine was not alcohol. This wine that we see here is the pure juice of the grape. And when we take the pure juice of the grape, whether it be from the grape itself or from other various plants, whether it be pomegranate, whether it be other type of fruits like orange, these juices are able to take nutrients quickly into the system to be digested quickly or I should say assimilated quickly and to give nutrients and healing to the body quicker than trying to eat and digest all of it. And many people that are sick by taking of these juices, they're able to quickly restore the system and bring the healing power that's in the fruits and vegetables that God has, this healing power in the system quickly rejuvenating them, building their blood. The Bible says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And by building it up through these juices, we're even able to help people that are sick or have often infirmities recover their health. And I'll even say something also. You know that juice is not always just fresh juice that you take from a grape or from an orange or from a carrot or something like that and juice in a juicer. You know another type of juice that's very healing? It's called soup. You ever see people take vegetables and various things and they put it in water and they boil it and because they boil it the minerals come out and they make a mineral rich broth and they basically drink that? It's still a juice. As a matter of fact when you take say some golden seal or some myrrh, something like that, and you put it in a tea bag and you put hot water over it and let the strength come out, what is that tea now? It really is a juice. It's the juices from those tea bags, the healing influences, the oils, the so on and so forth, the tannins are now leached out into the water and it becomes a juice. It's called a tea, but it's basically what? A juice. And by partaking of these things, the healing properties are quickly assimilated in the system and we're able to be rejuvenated. It's a part of the simple remedies that God has. Let's recapitulate for a moment as we come down to our last item. First of all, we looked at what? A plant-based diet and water. water. This is one of the first and most fundamental changes that if we partake of in the Spirit of God and clearly, we'll, by partaking of a plant-based diet and water, we'll see that we'll lose weight if we need to. Our cholesterol will go down if it needs to. Our blood pressure will go down. Our, our energy will go up. Our strength, our vitality, mentally, physically, and spiritually, we see a rejuvenation just starting with that one point of a plant-based diet and water. But what's the second part? Simple herbs. Simple herbs. These things that because we may have some infirmities or might be dealing with certain things or may have something that come upon us now and then, these simple herbs are take the place of more stronger and sometimes dangerous medications that generally people take and they provide the healing the nations need even as they're outlined point by point in the scriptures like aloe, cinnamon, calamus. Now there's some things that we know as we talk about spices that may be irritating but some things can be used medicinally if we understand them to give the healing and remove those often infirmities like juices like teas, like soups, that are going to give that nutrient power to the body quickly as we partake of it. Plant-based diet and water, simple remedies or simple herbs. Then we talked about number three, juices. And the last one, as we close, last one, the last one, number four, fasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer. Now when we look at that, someone say, what? Fasting and prayer? How is that a part of health? I can't go a day without eating. Well, that's maybe your problem. One of the reasons why we have so much sickness, as the Bible said in Luke 21, is eating and drinking. He says, gluttony and surfeiting. And we will find that many times when we have headache and various different complaints and stomach problems, that if we could subsist on a diet, simply a diet of a plant-based diet, that in itself, a plant-based diet in water, is enough of a fast to cause many diseases to seem to disappear. But sometimes there's a need of maybe an abstinence of food for a small period of time, to gain some benefit. But when we look at the scriptures, all through the scriptures, there's always been a benefit to fasting and prayer. As we close, look at what your Savior says in the book of Mark. We're in maybe around Matthew now. Look at Matthew, Mark, second book of the New Testament, Mark chapter 9. And let's see what the Savior of the world says concerning the importance of fasting and prayer. Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark 9, Mark the ninth chapter, and verse 28. Mark 9 and verse 28. You're familiar with the time when the disciples, who had cast out literally hundreds of demons in various cities all over Galilee, all over Judea, they came and all of them together couldn't cast out one. Why? What were they lacking now that they had all before that they were able to cast out all those demons all over and even exclaim that the devil was subject unto them through your name, Jesus? But now all 12, couldn't all, I should say, all nine of them together could not cast out one. Look what it says in Mark 9. And verse 28. 
It says, and when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast that devil, cast him out? Verse 29, he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing, but by what? Brothers and sisters, is the, is the problem that we have with health just a physical warfare we're dealing with? It's a spiritual warfare. And if you don't believe that, try to exercise the power of self-control and willpower when you have none. Because guess what temperance is? It's not a natural endowment. Some people say, man, he has a lot of willpower. The Bible says that temperance is a spiritual gift. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, but it's also what? Temperance. When the Spirit comes into life, the Spirit gives a fruit or a part of this fruit, if you will, a quality called temperance. And the ab ability to have the power of the will subject to the Word of God is this power of temperance. And to exercise it, even to the subjection of appetite like Daniel did, subjection of, of, of our passion and desire like Joseph did, these things come through the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. Temperance. And when we look at that, brothers and sisters, we're talking about Jesus saying that these powers of the enemy, whether it's a literal demon or the forces of the devil coming and attacking us, we can't do anything to remove it except by what? Fasting and prayer. Now let's look at this topic. Let's look at this topic just quickly. Look at the book of Leviticus. Let's go to the Old Testament. Were the people of God anciently commissioned, commanded to fast and pray during the year of worshiping the Lord? Leviticus 16. Let's turn to Leviticus 16. In the Old Testament, Leviticus 16, let's see that the people of God were called to fasting and prayer. Leviticus 16, and we're going to drop our eyes down to verse 29. Leviticus 16 and verse 29. Have you ever heard of the Day of Atonement? The Day of Atonement? They call it now Yom Kippur. The Day of Atonement. What was taking place on the Day of Atonement? What was, what was the, the, the central thing that was taking place that most people, they were what? Cleansing of sin. Cleansing of sin. Let's see, let's see what, what the main thing that they were doing that was so, so visible to the heathen. Now the heathen may not have known what they were doing in their heart, but what was the most, uh, the most clearest thing that they were doing that we see here in Leviticus 16? Let's see what it says. Leviticus 16, beginning in verse 29. Because this is what was happening anciently. Let's see if we see this all through the scriptures, even in the last days. In Leviticus 16, it says this, verse 29, And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls, and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country, or of a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day, the priest shall make an atonement for you, to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. This day, the day of atonement, they were to be clean from what? All their sins. That God was going to cleanse them and wanted them to be clean from all their sins before the Lord. So to prepare them for this awesome day of cleansing and, and coming in righteousness and justification to the Lord, he commanded them to do what? Afflict their soul. Now you may say, what is afflicting the soul by which they were being prepared for being justified completely? or being completely righteous before the Lord, clean from all their sin. What was this afflicting of the soul? Isaiah tells you. Look at Isaiah 58. In Isaiah 58, the Word of God shows exactly what affliction of the soul, or afflicting the soul, really means. Isaiah 58, let's see the definition. Isaiah 58, Isaiah 58, and we're going to drop our eyes in Isaiah 58 to verse 3. In Isaiah 53, sorry, 58 and verse 3, we see the definition of afflicting the soul that is mentioned in the 16th chapter of Leviticus. And we'll see that it is fasting and prayer. This is what they did to prepare to live a victorious, sin-free life before God on that day of atonement. Isaiah 58 and verse 3 says this. Say amen if you have that. Amen. Isaiah 58, 3 says, Wherefore have we what? Fasted, say they, and thou seest not. Wherefore have we done what? afflicted our soul and thou takest no not. God said hey these people that are the Jews that are the people of God I'm not taking any notice to them I'm not going to take any I am not going to, I'm not going to regard them the people cried out and said wherefore have we fasted wherefore have we done what afflicted our soul and you did what took no not. afflicting of the soul was fasting and prayer on the day of atonement anciently the day when God would cleanse them from their sins, they were fasting and 
praying. They were preparing to live a perfect life before God. And that idea, when we look at Exodus, uh, Leviticus 16, it said that, that that atonement was a cleansing from sin. If you read further in the book of Leviticus, it says clearly that this cleansing from sin was the cleansing of the people, the priests, and the sanctuary. This complete work was a work in the Jewish year. At the end of the Jewish year, the people, the priests, and the sanctuary would be all cleansed. It would be atoned for. It was called the Day of Atonement, where God would cleanse his people. He would cleanse the sanctuary. He would cleanse the priesthood. Now, brothers and sisters, do you know that not only do we see this in the Old Testament as a way of preparing to live victoriously, but when Jesus came to the earth and he was baptized in, on the River Jordan and he began his last days, if you will, upon the earth, what did he do to begin this public ministry? In Matthew 4 and verse 1, it says, And Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. Verse 2 says, And after 40 days, he fasted for what? 40 days and 40 nights. He was afterward on hunger. Jesus fasted for how long? 40 days and 40 nights. And if the ancient Israelites did it, and Jesus did it, do you think the people in the last days that must be preparing for Christ's second coming, that are at the, not the end of the Jewish year, but the end of time, that are not literal Israel, but spiritual Israel, that are leading to meet the Lord in peace and also be prepared to live a justified and perfect life before God, you think that they will not have to also afflict their souls? In the book of Daniel, remember we said that a certain diet is necessary to understand the prophecy. Look what Daniel says. In the book of Daniel, it says this. Daniel prophesied that in the last days, we're looking for the book of Daniel, in the last days, the people of God would again enter into, not the literal sanctuary that was destroyed, not the literal priesthood or literal Israel, but the spiritual people of God would again enter into the Day of Atonement or the cleansing of the sanctuary. We're in Daniel, the 8th chapter. Daniel 8, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. Know the prophecy of Daniel 8. Daniel 8 and verse 14. Say amen when you have that. We're almost finished. Daniel 8 and 14. In Daniel 8 and verse 14, we see the key text for the people of God in these last days because we're looking at the last work that God would do before he comes again. His last work of cleansing his people, his priests, his sanctuary, that the end of all things, even the Jewish year, but now the end of the gospel era would be able to come. In Daniel 8, in verse 14 he says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Daniel had a prophecy of 2,300 days, and at the end of these 2,300 days, the sanctuary would be cleansed. Now Daniel knew that this was not 2,300 literal days, because it says very clearly in verse 26, that the vision of the evening mornings, which I was told is true, and shut the, thing up, and shut the vision, for it shall be for many days. Daniel 12 says these times when these visions will be shut up will be all the way until the last days. Not just a couple, maybe three or four years after this period. It was shut up until the last days when Daniel would at the end stand his lot. The 2300 days, brothers and sisters, went from the time of Daniel all the way down to the end of time, even to our time. And in this time, God is now cleansing the sanctuary or atoning the sanctuary. He is making a cleansing work for his people, for his priests, for his sanctuary. Anciently, which was a shadow of things to come, the people fasted and prayed. What do you think will happen now before Jesus comes again at the end of the world where we're now again in the day of atonement and we're called to this holy convocation? What should we be doing? Fasting and prayer. And what kind of fasting and prayer do you think would be appropriate or give us the perfection? Remember we said four times three equals what? What is seven? Perfection. The perfection of character and the holiness before God that we need in these last days. What do you think would be this type of fast that was needed to make these things right and to be ready in the last days to meet the Lord mentally, physically, and spiritually, understand the Word of God in a clear and spiritual way in connection with God's Spirit and standing among Israel, sanctified by the atoning work, the cleansing work that He was going to do in us as well as the whole nation. What thing we should we do? We're in Daniel 9, I'm sorry, Daniel 8. Turn over to Daniel 10. In Daniel 10, we see that Daniel also fasted. In Daniel 9, we see he fasted. 
trying to understand the things of God, but also in Daniel chapter 10, we see he fasted. And notice what it says here. In Daniel 10 chapter, Daniel 10, beginning in verse 1, notice how Daniel fasted and what this fast partook of or consisted of. In Daniel 10 and verse 1 it says, In the third year Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel whose name was Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. Now you turn to go to Psalms 32. We'll, we won't go there now because we don't have time. David says that this mourning, again, is fasting and prayer. When the Jews would mourn, they would fast and pray. They would put on sackcloth. He was mourning how long? Three full weeks. He was fasting three full weeks. Now when he fasted, let's see if he was like Jesus, eating no food, or was he eating a certain type of food that was fasting, but fasting from some things. Look what it says. Verse 2 again. In those days, our Daniel was mourning three full weeks. I ate no what? Pleasant bread or stimulating or, or, or pleasing food. Neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I know myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. How did he fast, brothers and sisters? Did he abstain from all food or from certain foods? He abstained from certain foods. So he was eating, but he ate no pleasant or just unnecessary food. He ate the most choice food that was not just pleasing, but it was good food. But he certainly ate no flesh and no wine. What could he have possibly been eating that was not flesh and was not wine, but was a simple diet that God recognized as a fast or fasting in the book of Daniel chapter 10? That plant is diet we saw in Daniel chapter 1, where he ate pulse and drank what? You know what we're seeing, brothers and sisters? That this diet that we see that was eaten by Daniel in Daniel chapter 1, which we found was a plant-based diet, that also includes the very simple herbs, which are part of it, that go along with that pulse, because the plant-based diet, the simple remedies, come also from the garden, and that water, the simple remedies, even the juices that come from the grape, the cluster, all these things are the type of diet the people of God are going to enter into at the last days when God is now cleansing the sanctuary. And these last days when God is ready to prepare his people, there is a certain diet that's going to help them because these meat recalls that we're seeing and these outbreaks of salmon and all these poisons that are going throughout the animal kingdom, even these terrible diseases, are not an accident, brothers and sisters. They are a part of the prophecies fulfilling themselves. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, all the things that happened when Egypt was being destroyed and they were coming out are being fulfilled today. When they left Egypt, as they were leaving out, plagues fell upon Egypt as they were leaving, did it not? As we're leaving spiritual Babylon, will plagues fall in the similar sense upon the earth? Yes. How many plagues are falling in the end time? Seven last plagues. How many fell anciently? Ten. But guess what? In the ancient Egyptian land, the first three fell upon sinner and saint. The last seven fell only upon the wicked. The plagues in Revelation chapter 16 that deal with the seven last plagues fall only upon the wicked, which means, since there's seven last plagues, there's some plagues that precede them. And those plagues will fall upon the wicked and the righteous if they're not cautious. What plagues fell in the ancient Israel king, or ancient kingdom of, of Egypt that fell upon man and beast. First plague, the river turned to blood and all the fish died. What did they eat in, in Egypt according to Numbers chapter 12? Fish. It was a flesh-based diet. This was the main food they ate. All the river turned to blood and everything in the river died. In other words, there was death in those fish. Because people don't eat live fish, do they? But guess what was in that fish? Death. There was disease in animals in Egypt. The next plague you saw, they had frogs. Frogs came up out of the river and they went everywhere and Pharaoh entreated that they would go away and Moses gave the word from God and they all died. They all what? They died. And they swept them together and there was, the whole land was corrupted and stank because of all the frogs. Now, these frogs also had death. They also died. Next came lice. Do you see a trend here? First was something in the water. Last was something only upon the land that was on man and beast because men can get lice and also animals can get lice. From the water to the land, and even the frog is on the water and the land. 
What does that represent? That represents all animal creation. From the least to the greatest, from the war to the, to the, to the man to the beast, all the, cre all the animals will have what? Death in them. The plagues will fall upon the animals. And this is how systematically, in the first three plagues, these plagues fell upon man and beast. Brothers and sisters, what are we seeing in these last days? Mad cow disease, Asian bird flu, can I go on? On and on and on, we see all these things happening. And they're showing the people of God, not only is God calling us into a diet that's going to prepare us for the end time, but also, as Jesus said, there'll be plagues and pestilences in the land. And by these principles that he's given us, even this preparation, gathering his people in under his cloud, under his covering, he's preparing them to be alive and remain when Jesus comes again. When you look at 1 Thessalonians, I always wonder that, that text, why does it say they're alive and remain? Was it the martyrdom? Was it just the, but brothers and sisters, all these things that are happening are going to cause the people of God to go through great peril in the last days, and some are going to die simply because they didn't take care to what they ate and drank. Ecclesiastes says, why should you die before your time? Four times three equals what? Seven. Seven. A perfect system God has to prepare people mentally, physically, and spiritually to stand with him in the judgment hour. Let's have a word of prayer as we close. Heavenly Father, tonight as we heard these messages, maybe someone tonight wants to think differently about what they're eating. Not just because they are concerned with the diseases that are coming upon all the world in the form of animal foods, but also because we're trying to make a spiritual preparation for Jesus' second coming. And we know that a certain diet that in Daniel 10 we saw outlined for us was that diet that Daniel adopted to help him understand the prophecies, even to have spiritual understanding. We saw that there was a special diet that he found in Daniel chapter 1 that caused him to understand visions and dreams. And Lord, we want to understand the prophecies. And we have to have an understanding truly of thy word. We see that these simple remedies, whether they be from the tree or from the earth, these things are to afford us a removal of disease, even simple juices that are to remove simple ailments or even often infirmities. Lord, all these things you've provided for us that we may be, by partaking of these plant-based foods and water and these juices and simple remedies, we may be partaking of the diet for the last church. We might be prepared to stand as your people, your spiritual Israel, preparing for the last days, even in the time when Jesus is soon to come. Lord, I pray that as we continue in this convocation and study these principles line upon line and precept upon precept, tomorrow especially going into the school of Christ and going deeper into your word, that you would give us a greater understanding of the high cons you have for us in Christ Jesus. I pray that you would give us the power of the Holy Spirit as we come and desire to come closer and closer to a relationship with thee. That you would look deeply into our heart, dear God, and show us those things that are not like thee. The pride, the foolishness, the desire to even put aside your word for foolish things. Help us, dear God. We know that you have power to save from sin. We believe Lord, help our unbelief. We believe that you have power to set us free, even to deliver us from the habits that have shackled us, even poor habits of hell. Lord, we pray that you would give us health and life through thy divine word, even now. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.